Welcome to the cross borders. In- uh, welcome to the cross border interviews. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and we are continuing our municipal series where we sit down with local elected leaders from across this great country to talk about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today, we are heading to the province of Quebec to sit down with the mayor of West, the city of Westmont, Mayor Christina Smith. Mayor Smith, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you. So, uh, Christina, I'm going to start with the same old question that I've asked every other municipal politician. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, it's sort of an interesting question. It was, uh, I'd always been uh, engaged in politics. Like from, I mean, I grew up in a house where, you know, my parents volunteered on on campaigns. They were putting up lawn signs. Like it was, it was something that was actively discussed in our household. Um, both my parents were big volunteers, not just in like politically, obviously, but just in their community. Like they, it was sort of an example in our, in our, it was an example that was set in our house that you are engaged in your community and you give back. Um, and in particular, my mother was quite, uh, quite politically involved. And so I got involved like we, you know, did when we were kids, like we were forced to go put up the campaign signs, uh, a lot, you know, along uh, along the roads of of our. I, I grew up in a little city in a in a demerged city as well, and on the island of Montreal called Beaconsfield. So, um, so it was always there. And then I studied political science in university, and from there I worked uh, with the federal government. So I was always very engaged in federal politics, um, but not in municipal politics, uh, not at all in municipal. I mean, the extent of my involvement in municipal politics. Uh, probably at that time was that I voted, you know, I voted in every election that I could vote in, but I was not, uh, as you see, as you know, I'm sure you've followed a lot of council meetings, you see often sort of the same people engaged at, at council meetings uh, with this, you know, recurring issues that they that they care about or that they want to address. I, I wasn't one of those people. Um, and so I was working, uh, had two kids. And uh, I was I was working for Coca Cola at the time. I was traveling quite a lot, and I decided uh, that I was going to take a break in between a break from Coca Cola and between my second and my third kid. And I had a, a very freak accident happened, uh, where a car I was pushing my kids to preschool, like so, one in the stroller, one on a board, pregnant with a third, and uh, a car rolled down the hill uh, and hit another car hit us we were we were you know luckily unharmed uh physically but it was sort of the beginning of my engagement with the municipal world a little bit of like hey wait a second we're a city on a hill not unlike san francisco san francisco has these municipal bylaws where you turn your you have to turn your wheels to the curb on a hill we didn't have that in place we discussed it it was done fairly quickly it was done in a very uh, collaborative way. It was, um, and so that was sort of the beginning of my engagement on the municipal level. And when you have a young family, you use your city differently, right? Than you than you do prior to prior to that, and or everybody uses it in a different way. But it was, you know, the library became incredibly important to me. We were the, at the time the mayor at the time was working on a project of building a, a recreation center. So. Uh, demolishing our former rink and you know they, we love hockey in this town so demolishing our former rink and pool and building two underground rinks which are you know a lead certified building and a new pool and it was a very hot topic in the community of you know and a lot of people very well you know not a lot a small group but very vocal very vocal in their opposition to the project so that sort of started my engagement as well in, in the community of, you know, we need these buildings, we need these facilities. If you want to be a place, if you want to be a great city for all ages, you have to address some of these issues and that you need sports facilities. So that sort of began my, and then I decided to run Well, I sort of was asked to run and I, I did it. And it was one of those things where I told the paper that I was running and then I was like, oh my God, now I have to do it. It's like in print. <laughs> what have I done? Uh, um, so this is, people- this is in 2012 that you've officially, or 2013, thir- th- thir- yeah, 2013 so is when you when were was- elected, right? Yeah. So 2011 is sort of when 
I start kind of engaging with the city on on these issues, but in a very collaborative way. I wasn't the, I wasn't yelling at the microphone at uh, at council meetings or anything like that. It was I started you know getting involved in in some of these issues, but it was uh, and yeah, the election was in 2013. Um, so it was, and, and I I ran against someone who who's still very involved. He was there asking questions last night at council. Um, a very a very nice gentleman who's incredibly committed to the city. But he had been, you know, he's he'd gone to every public meeting, every council meeting, you know, for years and years and years. And I come along and I run and, and I win that election. Um, and then the mayor at the time, who had been a long serving mayor, he had served five terms for the city of Westmount. He had been part of our demerge. He, you know, led the fight against the forced mergers in uh, the province of Quebec. And when he retired, I took on as interim mayor and then I was elected as mayor in 2017. So it comes from, like I did the circle back to like, where does it, I do believe even after COVID and all the difficulties during the pandemic for elected officials, it's really, I, I still believe in public service. I believe in every level of government, especially municipal. Like it's, as you see today, like we've got our blue collar workers are striking, but it is, you know, if, if you don't pick up garbage, you notice it immediately. If the federal government strikes, perhaps the impact is a little less direct on you. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to be engaged in your in your community. Um, and so that's where it sort of came from was like, you know, how can I contribute as opposed to I'm really angry and I, you know, I want to tear this place down. It's uh, so I, I, I looked at it from from that side of you, but it's for sure it's like a family influence and and my mom and all her campaigns and running campaigns off our dining room table and things like that growing up has obviously so, had an influence. So I want to go back to that first election in 2013, because you seem like someone who has the pulse of their community and you seem like you were engaged in the community. You knew what was going on in your community. When you were out door knocking though, were there issues that were arising that you didn't prepare for that you went, Oh, I'm surprised that this issue is coming forward from residents. And I'm happy people are talking about it because then if elected, I can address those at the council table. Yeah. I think what I was most surprised about is how personal some of the issues are, right? Like they are, they are so micro when it comes to, and listen, we're a tiny city. We're a, a city of 20,000 people, 21,000 people surrounded entirely by the mega city of Montreal. Um, and we, you know, fought hard to be an independent city and to remain an independent city. So I was surprised, I guess, you know, door knocking of people, how much they were uh, wanting to talk about a very, you know, a very personal issue. And, and it was made very clear to me, you know, this is municipal politics. This is about people's windows. It's their permit that they didn't get for their back deck that they wanted that doesn't meet the guidelines, but you know, they still want it. So can't I just have what I want? Um, and then obviously the broader issue of that, you know, all cities are facing and we are certainly facing is the infrastructure problems. So the, the terrible state of the roads, the terrible state of the sidewalks, the, um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, also what I found too, is that people, and I still, see this where people sort of expect the city to almost mediate issues that are very local and personalized and obviously you know mediate an issue with their neighbor um and that's not necessarily that's obviously not the role of the city uh but it's yeah i was i was surprised at how personal it was for people but what at also on the flip side when i'm door knocking in 2013 and it's very different i've knocked a lot of doors for candidates um it's very different to be the face on the pamphlet. It's, uh, and is when it, you start, is it news, different to be the name on the ballot as well? Because walking into that ballot, everyone remembers the first time they see their name on the ballot. Yeah. And it is an experience uh -huh. that you can never forget. I still remember back in 2010 when I was on the ballot. And I, I look at that moment, I go, I, why did I put my name on that ballot? Well, what, what was I accomplishing <laughs> there? So for you, what was and, that experience like being the name on the brochure, but also the ballot as well? Well, I guess it, 2013 and 2017 were very different because one was a council seat and one was a mayor's seat. It was also the first time there'd been a real mayor's contest in, in decades. Basically, they had either been acclaimed or if they weren't acclaimed, it was, you know, a very sort of rogue candidate running against an establishment or, you know, a candidate that was, you know, likely to win. So it was... Uh, 
I had no idea. I mean, I sort of went into this council thing and yeah, seeing my name on the ballot was like, oh my gosh, now I need to, to, and I don't think people realized, um, I mean, I knew cause I'd worked on, on, uh, campaigns and I'd, I'd worked with federal cabinet ministers during, you know, big national campaigns, how much work an election is because it really is. And it's even harder in a municipal election because it comes down to a handful of votes, right? It's, 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 and hardly anyone votes, which is really, you know, if someone asked me what I want to focus on going forward, get people to vote. You know, there's, we have a lot of people that share their feedback, vote, like make sure you vote, vote in every election that you can. And you need to, we, we have a voter turnout rate, you know, about 30% in a good year for a municipal election is astounding to me. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a question to you here, uh, Mayor Smith, because you are one of the only can, uh, people that I've had on the show who have been acclaimed into your position for your second term. In 2021, yes. you were acclaimed as mayor. You, you talk about the need for people to vote, but do we need people to run municipally as well? Because you never hear yes. about acclamations provincially or federally, but municipally it seems to be the thing. In Ontario, there was a whole town that was acclaimed to their position. No election was needed. Do people need to yeah. step up as well and put their name on the ballot? Yeah, I must say, as we were waiting, it was actually it was on my birthday, the day that 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 you know the cutoff for are you you know is someone going to run against me? And I was expecting someone to you know come out of the woodwork in the last minute or something like that, and you know they didn't. It waited till four p.m. And as much as I was relieved in some ways that. I didn't have to, you know, get into a nasty fight with people that, you know, people, you see them at the grocery store, you see, like, you know, I run into my, the, my former opponent who, you know, we have a great relationship now, but like, you know, you see them everywhere and it's naturally pitting a person against another. You see their supporters everywhere. It's um, so it's tough. So uh, while I was glad to be acclaimed or somewhat relieved, it feels a little less legitimate. I got to say, like, it's, it's uh you know, the election when I, when I was elected, it was, you know, feels legitimate. Uh, but it is, it's, uh, I think we're going to see more of that because it's, um, there's so much misinformation. There's, you know, people don't, it's, it's not a natural state for people to be like, you know, ripped apart in the, in their local community Facebook page, like, which is what, what happens, right? It's, it's, you know, people say, all sorts of things that aren't true about me or about our council or about the city or what we're doing or, you know, holding us accountable for someone's bad behavior. Um, and I think a lot of people shy away from wanting that it's, it's so close to home. So we've got to figure out a way uh, to bring back sort of the civil discourse of, of and, and we're going to get better candidates because of it. Like, we're not going to like what happens when, uh, when all you do is spread lies about people, no normal people or decent people aren't going to want to step up. And, and these jobs are typically, you know, not like, you know, it's not like anyone, it, it, they're not extremely well paid by any stretch of the matter. And they, uh, you have, you know, people in the community, people yelling at you on the soccer field while you're at your kid's soccer game. So how do you balance uh, that? Like how that. do you as mayor balance that? Because I can imagine there's times that you just want to be mom, Christina. You don't want to be mayor, Christina yeah. Smith. You want to be mom. You want to be just Christina out at the grocery store. How have you been able to balance that in your tenure as an elected official to say, okay, I know I'm going to be attacked because that's what that comes with the territory in politics, but there has to be a line that I have to say, okay, enough's enough people. I will block you. I will tell you to like, leave me alone. At what point in time do you as mayor or as an elected official have to say enough is enough and I'm not taking it anymore? Yeah, I mean, I got it. And I, I would say that I'm not great at that. Uh, I'm not great at cutting them off uh, when I should cut them off. There, there you know, there are residents. I, I probably have only two residents that uh, we just can't respond to, right? Because it's so toxic. It's so full of, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's almost sad. Uh, but we we do try and find a balance. But I had yeah, I mean I I I was in a, a grocery store in Westmount. There's one big grocery store in Westmount, and uh, I ran into a former city councilor who laughed at me. It was like you know five o'clock on a Monday, like everybody's grouchy, and uh, she said to me, "What on earth are you doing in here? Like you're insane." I was like, "Well, they you know I don't have any food in the house. Like they need to eat." So it's 
it, it does affect my kids though. And it does, they do not like it when, uh, certainly if there's any type of scene, they do not like that. That is, that's upsetting. And my oldest is a 15 year old, you know, she's that, that, you know, no 15 year old wants their mother to have this, you know, as they put it, a very embarrassing job. Um, and so they don't love if somebody's angry, that upsets them. And they've seen it a few times and it really affects them. So I try and, you know, shield them from that. And I have a pretty standard answer. Like you can reach me at the office. I'm very accessible, but I'm now at my kid's soccer game. So you need to respect that. Do most people most respect part, them? Yeah. I, I, you know, most, most people respect that. There's a lot of like, you know, comments that get dropped and hopefully those don't affect my kids as much, but it's, uh, for the most part, it's, it's yes, people respect it, but when they don't, it can go sideways pretty quickly. So the last question on this segment before we turn to the uh, city of Westmont in general is the first moment you walked into the council chambers as an elected official, not as mayor, but as district five representative uh, councillor elect Christina Smith. Was there a weight and responsibility that you put on your shoulders to make sure that you were educated in the matters that were in front of council, that you were prepared at each council meeting, and that you were aware of what the needs and your wants of your community were when addressing and talking at council? Or was there a, another weight that you put on your shoulders to say, okay, the decisions I make are going to affect the pocketbooks of my neighbors, the pocketbooks of my family members, how much of a responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers? I think it's a great question because it is, it is a huge responsibility. And I like, and you know, I think when you are, especially at the municipal level, right, you're taxed at, you know, the value of your home. So I'm very aware that everything we do comes into, you know, a contribution from a family whose average tax bill, $15,000. It's, you know, they pay a lot in taxes you know, what we're doing is spending their money. So we have to do it uh, wisely. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think we do. I think we are good stewards of, of tax dollars. And But the problem being, can't do all the work that needs to get done, right? Nobody can. There's always more work to do. Uh, but it was, yeah, when you first become a counselor, and I see it with new counselors now too, you, you want to, so people run for office because they want to solve a problem. Like the, the people who win typically, you know, they want to, they want to solve things. They want to make things better. They want to, and, and I think you realize uh, you have to, you know, strike a balance between, you know, you're going to get requests that you can't solve uh, requests that, you know, don't meet our bylaws that are, or, you know, somebody can't have, you know, you know, the, the urban planning permit that they, that they want because of, you know, very valid reasons. You still I, you know, you see it in counselors, they still want to want to help, or you have to make decisions that are, you know, also for the future, right? So we, we had, you know, a very long discussion about a road reconstruction. Roads are built differently now. We have to, we have roads at the top of the hill that need to retain water. We can't have all the water, you know, that we come in these intense storms that, you know, climate change has changed the weather and these intense storms. So we, we, when we redesign a road, we you know, build better catch basins, we build better water management systems, and we focus more on pedestrians. So we we want bump outs, we want raised crosswalks, we want kids to be able to walk to school. I want them to, I want every kid, we have 12 schools in Westmount. It'd be great if all every kid was, you know, walking to school uh, and felt safe doing it. And I think if parents understood that with every road that we redo, you know, that's for a generation, that our commitment is that we will make it safer for pedestrians, then, you know, I'm very comfortable with that. But the people who live on a road may, may say, well, you know, this is how it's always been. I want it to continue to be this way. You have to build for the future. And so they are, you know, that street could be very, very angry. Um, but you have to, it would be a mistake to build a road because the people on that street don't want it to change ever. But you have to, you have to change with the the demands of uh, the you know, water retention, things like that. And so, yeah, I think it's, 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 uh, 
and if you stop caring about the implications of the job, then it's time to not do the job is what uh, what I would say. The worst saying in municipal politics, and I've said this since I was a former staffer for a municipality, is we've always done it that way, so we're going to continue doing it that way. I, I've always rejected yeah. that saying, so I'm glad that you said it as well. Um, I want to now turn to segment two. And that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's just I, on that point, it's it's and I, I do think this has had, you know, we, we can't I find every time we, we say something, it's like, well, COVID, COVID, COVID. The pandemic has changed people, how has changed how people view their community. They spent a lot more time. I mean, I had a city full of CEOs that were like, you know, zooming from their living rooms and all of a sudden had a lot of feedback on like garbage collection routes and snow removal and things like that. So they, uh, but it is, the, the city has changed, I think. And I think in, you see it across, I mean, it's why Ontario has put in, you know, new legislation to sort of overrule the NIMBYs a little bit, right? Like where this this reluctance to change is people are really digging in on it. And, you know, we, we just, there are things that are going to need to change, like slight densification to avoid, you know, complete urban sprawl on our farmland is 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 not a bad thing. Slight mm -hmm. densification around a metro station is not a crazy, wild idea. It is pretty standard. You, you've taken yeah. some of the questions out of my uh, repertoire for the next segment, and then we're going to turn to segment two. And before we do uh, ask the first question, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion at council. This is not a policy okay. at council. <laughs> this is her opinion and her opinion only. We seem to always get uh, emails about this question. So, uh, mayor. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Westmont today? Uh, our infrastructure challenges. So it is, uh, and how we address them, because you can't address them. You can't pay all the bills on uh, the current tax bill, right? So we half of our, our taxes go to the city of Montreal to pay for things like major bills that we need to pay, which would be uh, public security, policing, and public transit and water. And so the current structure of that, I just don't think is sustainable as if, in terms of what we also need for our infrastructure upgrades, right? We've got old pipes, we've got, you know, a water network that needs, and, you know, water is, all of our roads are, people will often ask me, you know, why are you built, why are you redoing this road? It's not as terrible as, I could list, you know, 10 roads that they'll say it's not as terrible as that one. And you'll say, because the state of the water network, it's drip, that drives the work that gets done above, right? Because without water, I mean, I mean, it's a basic, uh, a basic service that we obviously need to, we need to supply. And that, you know, the cost of investing in that and the infrastructure and, you know, every year we're trying to do more and we're pushing, you know, I, I have pushed our engineering team to the absolute max, um, which I'm aware of. Like we are aware of how hard we are pushing them and they're achieving it. We're getting, you know, a hundred, almost a hundred percent completion rates in terms of the work that we set out to do that we tax residents for, but it's not, you know, there's, there's so much more, right? So if, how if, often say, are I you say, in conversation with your federal and provincial counterparts? Because you, like you said, you can't, you can't continue to drain people's bank accounts because you want to continue to grow the city. You have to look for grants as well. So how often yeah. are you looking at the province and the federal government to say, okay, guys, we're struggling here because you're not the only mayor or counselor who said infrastructure aging is an issue for their community. How often are you yeah. talking to the other levels? So I'm I'm very fortunate in that I have a very good relationship both with Mark Arnault and Jennifer Macron. Um, and they they understand it too. And they they have certainly pushed for programs that would be uh that we would be able to get a grant for or support. We get, you know, we do get, you know support for water projects um, in the province and from the province of Quebec through the tech program. And so we're, we're in constant communication also in particular with our MNA, because a lot of those issues um, are overlapping, whether it be, you know, public security issues around, uh, you know, we've got some issues around Cabot square and under the Turcot and things like that. So, but when you look at something like public transit, that, you know, that that is certainly something where the infrastructure investment, you know, more than it is now should be coming from uh, should be coming from the province and the federal government. You can't look at it as 
it can't be seen as uh, a, a business where you make money, right? It's it's almost it's it's a service. It's it's like healthcare, right? We're not looking to, but we have to provide this service. And without a reliable, robust public transit system, uh, you know, where would we be as a city? And it's you know the STM. We, we're well served by uh, we're well served by public transit in Westmount. We've got, you know, one is not in Westmount, but it's right next door to us. We have two metro stations that are you know heavily used. We have a bike path that is incredibly that you know it's, it's the highest used bike path ridership uh, on the island. Um, we that's the Demesne of bike path. It's like a it's a highway basically in the in the summertime. Uh, and we have you know a bus network that doesn't necessarily serve the the top part of the city, but those those uh, services need more funding from different levels of government, and so it is important. And I'm, I'm I feel fortunate. I really like my MP. I really like my M and A. I we, really like your along. MP, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I and I, I I have a really good working relationship with both of them, and they both really truly serve our community like really really are uh our true public servants so i feel fortunate in that sense and and yeah so we worked with um mr garneau to get funding as well for like community projects which are are incredibly important around uh in particular around seniors he's been very helpful in us getting some funding for that but uh yeah, there's projects to come you know whether it's going to be building a new soccer field or or an indoor pool that funding should be coming from, uh, we should be able to get some of that funding from the province and from the federal government. Earlier on in the interview, you talked about the nimbyism and I wanted to, I want to uh, speak about that for That's a bit. If you're okay. Exactly. Because as mayor, as council, you have, you were there to move the city forward while the city of Westmont is elected at a district level for councillors, They all have the one common goal of moving the city forward as one. It can't be district one versus district four, district five versus district seven. It has to move together as one. How do you balance the need to move the city forward with the idea that there are some people in your community who will say, well, I like my community the way it is. I don't want it to change. I don't want these, these upgrades to work. So how do you balance the needs of moving the city forward as one, but also trying to bring those people who don't want it to change fast together? Okay. Uh yeah, I think that's an important one. And one of the, you know, the feedback that I'll get sometimes from the administration uh, and it's honest feedback is that they will say to me, you know, you're listening too much to the noise. You're not listening enough to the silence. You need to, you're, you're, you're trying to. And so I, you know, it's sort of in my nature of trying to like bring uh, it's I'm, I'm veering a little bit away from it because I realize you, you, you can't move things forward and have everybody on side. Right. So it's uh, there is a, there, I, I do believe there is a shift in, in a more intense nimbyism. And, you know, previous mayors, and uh, we talked about our m and and our MP, I'm very also, you know, we have two, two mayors who had done this job before me, and I'm very fortunate in that I can call them and ask them, you know, questions about why did you do this or how did this, you know, unfold. And they too had, uh, you know, the NIMBY approach to things but not to this level because it didn't have, they didn't have the same, you know, community Facebook groups of, is it because uh, of Facebook like that, that more the, vo the, the, the vocal minority is louder than it was say 10 years ago. I think so. I think, you know, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and any of these community Facebook groups, like there's one called everything Westmount, which was, uh, you know, everything Westmount was started by a local, uh, so, uh, you know, a, a woman who lives in the community who, who runs a very successful business during the pandemic, who wanted to help promote the restaurants that were suffering. So this was like the end of March, this, this page didn't exist before. It was like, you know, end of March, 2020. So she started this page to say like, Gentile's like got pizza and you can pick up at the window and the, you know, this shop is still open. And if you need boots for the rainy season, you can go to Tony. So it was, it was born of that and very quickly she had to sort of walk away from it because it became a, a, just sort of a general complaints page where, you know, people would write things not realizing, you know, that, you know, a human is, you know, I'm reading them. I'm reading what you're writing about me. Uh, and if you sort of ask them about it, then they, you know, obviously 
you know, a lot of people, I don't think there's actually someone on the other end reading this. So it's, uh, but I think the NIMBYism has, has grown out of there. I mean, we've seen a couple projects that should be, um, that are socially acceptable. And yet the, the, the power lies within, you know, the referendum, the registry process, all of that is, is not that hard to, is, is not that hard to attain if you have a clipboard and some time and are willing to knock on a few doors and tell people that, you know, your whole community is going to fall apart and change if this project is allowed to go through. So how so do you govern under that... that situation? How do you govern under that situation where any day someone with a clipboard can go and challenge any direction that council has? So I think it's, uh, you know, you've got to move forward with it. So we, we've got a project right now, um, or we've had a couple of projects recently uh, that, you know, one right at the end of the last mandate that was, uh, is on, is on a park is a currently, it was a, you know, a four unit building. It was going to be trans uh, transformed into a six unit building. It was going to have, you know, a major, a major redesign, but it needed a zoning change because it was going to have more densification. And the na the neighbors just, and like, let's be honest, it's, it's on a park next to a bus stop next to a public, you know, pub, in between the English public elementary school and the French public elementary school and a French public high school. And, you know, it, it has all the services around it that would warrant, and it was, you know, a 1950s build that is not a great building, but the people, uh, the neighbors were just so adamantly opposed to it uh, that it just, it was never going to, it, it could not move forward with no mat no amount of convincing was going to be able to move it forward in the end it's two uh very large you know semi-detached two very large modern homes on the park so two families in very large homes as opposed to six families joining a community of uh you know in lower Westmount, where, where there's you know tons of accessibility to, to programs and activities and so those things, you know, and that's probably on me and that I didn't, I, you know, wasn't able to convince the neighborhood uh, otherwise. And so that we're, we're seeing more of that right now. We have a, a project that's coming forward. Um, it's been four years in the making. It's, it's, it's the, uh, a former armory at the corner on, on Hillside that's, you know, going to be a 30 ish unit building. It's across from Westmount high school. It's across from a park. Um, and it is being opposed by the neighbors who live in a building that was just built that tore down another building to build that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to and, and we've said to them, you know, you live in a building that also had to integrate into the community and did that, you know, not that long ago, eight years ago, 10 years ago. And I'm assuming that, there were people uh, upset about that building being built as well, that you're now living in. <laughs> Yeah. And, but the way the zoning is, it's that, you know, there's a very small zone. So the people next door get to determine the future of the people who don't actually live there yet. <laughs> and so it's uh, this approach of I'd rather no change than, uh, than this sort of unknown change. And that this, listen, and we're not talking, you know, skyscrapers and towers here. We are, we are talking what we would call light densification as, you know, as a lot of the urban planners will talk about the missing middle that's in uh, in many of these cities, and we're a built city. We're a, and our job as Westmount councillors and as as mayor is obviously to protect. We have an incredible um, collection of heritage homes in this city, and it's if you are the mayor of Westmount and if you're on city council, that's you know one of your main roles is obviously to protect that. Um, but we have little pockets that aren't um, that aren't developed yet, uh, or aren't aren't built, or there is you know some opportunity for transformation. But any of those changes is becoming incredibly difficult, um, incredibly difficult to do. And when you talk to other mayors, it's it's the same thing, and it becomes very divisive in the communities. So my last question on this segment is uh, the idea that you you've you've laid out what you believe is the biggest issue that is facing your community today, and you said aging infrastructure. Now, if I go to the uh, the city of Westmont tomorrow and I go talk to 100 people in your community, they will all give me 100 different issues, whether it be a park, whether it be a sidewalk, whether it be a pothole, they will give me their issues. How do you balance the individual needs 
of your community because you only have a certain amount of money that you can collect every year and you have to put it to good use. And at the end of the day, you have to say, okay, this pothole on X street in front of uh, John's house is not going to be filled this year because pothole Y down the street in front of Jacob's house is a lot worse. How do you as mayor pick and choose? And as council, I should say, pick and choose who the, at the end of the day, the winners and the losers are about what issues need to be addressed when it comes to those individual issues. Yeah, so it's I think it's important. Obviously, we're we're the connection to the community. Mm -hmm. And it's this also speaks to it's really important that you have a strong administration um, and strong you know, leadership in that administration. So your engineering team, your public works teams, they, too, need to know the city and understand the infrastructure and the challenges that are there. So it's, um, and it's, what we've done this year is, is a different kind of three-year PTI where we would always do obviously a three-year capital works budget. And it, this next two years were an approximate, an estimate, but we wouldn't necessarily tell you, you know, this is exactly the street. We've drilled down a little bit further into the three years and at, you know, out to five years actually, but you know, what we're publishing is the three years and we put a map up, um, a map up on our website so you can see it. And so, yes, your street may be terrible, but it's not getting done in this mandate. And and I think it's just coming clean about it, right? Like there are, the the needs are so great, but your street may uh, have, you know, some cracks in it, but it's not happening. It's got, you know, a, a, a water system that has been, you know, whether it's been lined or it's actually been totally redone. And so there are greater needs and everything that's on there. So this is our largest capital works budget um, in terms of uh, our infrastructure work. If you take out, obviously, the years that where we build in an arena for $40 million, that changes things. But like in terms of like road, sewer, water, hydro is our largest year. None of these projects are, you know, vanity projects like, oh, I wish this, you know, that this is these are roads that need to be rebuilt. This is water that needs to be done or hydro infrastructure that we absolutely needs to be updated. Um, and at that, we're not even, you know, finishing. We're not even getting to the absolute must. We, you know, we have to make choices. You have to cut. And so I don't think people realize um, how much of that goes on, how much of, of saying, you know, that's unfortunate. That road does need to be done. That's cut. That's not happening this year. Um, and you got to be responsible, obviously, balancing with tax dollars. And I think what I feel, you know, proud that we're also doing is, you know, we're investing, you have to invest in people as well. So we are investing in people because they will do the work. And so we had, you know, a couple of years where we've done a massive, you know, an increase, a steady increase of, uh, of infrastructure work. And the previous mayor had started that trend of really, uh, of, of, increasing he had he was uh mayor trent at the time had split the engineering part department and the public works department so that all of our projects really had our engineering team on site seeing it saying no 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 you the, like the specs say you got to do this and you're you and so really and it, what it also meant is that the projects got done they got done on time and they were done largely on budget so um we have sort of followed that uh and, you know, built on that, that had been set up by the previous mayor. So it's, uh, but there is, uh, that's one part that citizens don't understand. You know, we are, we are cutting in there and it's, you cannot, there's also the, um, how much you can actually do, right? You could say, I, I have a hundred million dollars and I'm going to spend it all on roads. You need people to do it. Yeah. And you need the capacity to, to like the throughput, which is also a challenge now. And, and the HR components are a massive challenge for every organization and municipalities are, are not, uh, are, are not immune to that. We, we too have the challenges of, uh, of HR issues. So I'm very cautious of time here. So I want to turn to our last segment and this is my favorite segment because I get to learn about the, not the nuts and bolts of municipal government, but, but the tourism aspect of municipal government, because as a, Tourists coming to your city of Westmont or later this year, I will be in your community spending my economic development dollars I'm in your community. I will. What what should a tourist do? And what are some of the hidden gems in the city of Westmont that they have to stop in and see? Um, I love that question. They are, and it goes back to budgeting too, like where we where we set our priorities. And I think 
I'm very proud of, we've also invested in, in parks. So it's like finding the balance of, of parks and green spaces. And so we have, you know, a beautiful park at the top of the hills called Summit Woods, where it is, uh, you know, an urban forest uh, that, that has been protected and needs to continue to be protected and needs an investment. And those things take work um, and, and a financial commitment. So there's, uh, there's that. And then there's obviously Westmount Park, but it's also, I think it's incredible when people just drive around. And I love, I, I remember bringing my nephews here who live in Vancouver. So obviously the architecture is quite different in Vancouver. And when they were little, so, you know, like three years old and six years old, when they would come here and just sort of be in awe of of the houses and and the 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 buildings and you know this collection of Victorian era homes, and that takes work too, right? That takes a you know a city to be continually committed to the preservation of that, and I think that's what a lot of people are drawn in by Westmount is is sort of is the beauty of not just the green spaces but also the homes and the close proximity to um, the close proximity to downtown Montreal, right? We are um, you know, 10 minutes from downtown Montreal, yet we are uh, a neighborhood community that has soccer teams and hockey teams and a community pool and a library that people adore. And I, I would say, go see our library. Our library and our greenhouse that's attached to our library and our community center, Victoria Hall, are very special places. We are, um, we are constantly winning awards for our library and our librarians are an incredible team. So, what about yourself, though? After a hard day at council, after a stressful day, where do you go to decompress in the city of Westmont? And I, before you answer, you cannot say, because this seems to be a reoccurring theme, your own house. Where in the community can <laughs> you go to just decompress and let all the stress of the day go away? Um, I We've got some great restaurants. Uh, and, you know, in, in historically, we weren't sort of a restaurant destination at all because uh, you know, Montreal is a food city um, that people come to, you know, there are, there are phenomenal restaurants all throughout Montreal, but we've got some great restaurants. We've got, you know, I, I'll name a few, but then I'll leave some out, but it's uh you know, Tavern, which is a, it, it's been a longstanding restaurant in the a restaurant in the bottom of Westmount square. That's an incredible neighborhood restaurant for me obviously people come from much further than Westmount but um that there's another restaurant called Gentile that is uh is so fun and more like family style but it's uh I'd say those are the the places I go with you know play tennis in Murray Hill on our great clay courts up there or things like that and you know my kids do a lot of sports so I'm often people will often see me uh sitting in in the benches, you know, somewhere along uh, watching a rugby game or watching a soccer game or things like that. So I, I've got to ask the question because I, I know we're uh, tight on time here, but I've got to ask this question. Was the, the, the tennis courts renamed after Miss Bouchard? No, they were not. No, they were not. <laughs> okay. But, but she did fight on those. That was, she... a, that was a, a journalist very much twisted, uh, twisted what we had said about that. We were very excited for uh, Jeannie Bouchard and how she was doing uh, I believe it was at one of the Rogers Cups at that point that she'd had like you know a successful run there and it's great those are the you still see her um, you can still see her every now and again she'll be in the summer you see her you know practicing on those courts you also see what's fun for uh, the kids love this is that you know Cole Caulfield Suzuki there's lots of hockey players that live around town too and what's really great, especially during, um, you know, during the pandemic, when there were so many kids on on our outdoor rinks, we used to have a lot, you know, we put in a refrigerated rink and there would be a lineup for, you know, some kids would wait an hour because we had this, you know, the rules of how many kids, people could be on the ice because you needed the two. Anyway, all those seems like a long time ago that we were measuring two meters between uh, people on the ice. But it, it's great. They'll go and play like pickup hockey in Prince Albert Park or in, in Murray Hill Park. It's it's that is really fun for people to see. So my last question to you, this uh, uh, your worship, is this. Um, what makes the city of uh, Westmont such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Take as long as you want on this answer. I think it's a great, it's a very engaged community where people really care and they take a lot of pride in where they live. And that is, uh, so they have a lot of expectations, which can be sometimes hard 
to meet, but it is makes it a great city. And it's it's very much the people. Yes, there's beautiful buildings, there's beautiful architecture. Um, but it's the people. There's it's, it's a great community of people who are engaged and who want to volunteer in, in different ways. It's uh, you know, I won't name names, but we have this, you know, fairly famous uh Canadian business person who's whose company is a very large company is going entirely remote. And he said to me, I've looked all over the world and I've decided I want to. I'm coming to Westmount. I'm going to move to Westmount. He's like, what can I do? Can I be on the library committee? Can I, we've got, you know, really incredible people that want to be engaged. One of them uh, are just our, our head of our library foundation is, um, was Mitch Cohen, uh, who's known as Mitch Joel sort of in the media industry. Uh, But he's, there's an example of an incredibly busy person who is taking time to volunteer and really loves our public library, because that's where his kids first started engaging with the municipality and with our city. And he saw the value in it. So he's giving back his time. You see, you see it time and time again of, of people who give back their time and continue to give back their time, you know, uh, like whether it be our, our volunteer, we have this soccer, you know, a house league soccer program that runs in the spring and the coaches there are, you know, uh, uh, an ER doctor who makes sure that her shifts are not on those days that she's going to she's going to coach, you know, two of her kids soccer teams or the chairman of Hydro Quebec at the time coaching a soccer team. Like it's, there's so many examples of that, that make it just, it's, it's that make it a great community. Um, Mayor Smith, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me and talk about your community yourself. Um, I'm looking forward to visiting Westmont later this summer. I have a few stops in Quebec that I have to do. So Westmont is now on the agenda because you've pitched it so well to me and I'm looking forward to seeing it up close and personal this summer in hopefully not an RV, an actual car, but let's see what the husband says about that first. (laughs) Well, and you can uh, maybe you'll overlap with our Shakespeare in the Park or some of our summer activities, which are uh, also great programs that are put on by our our library and community events team. We've got some fun stuff that happens in the summer in our parks. Well, I'm looking forward to it. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society. It helps our democracy. And it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Tomorrow we are back with Saskatoon Mayor Charlie Clark. Tune in for that. Until then... Keep talking, everyone.